इंद्रजेमी जंब पर बाड़व सुअंब पर रावण सदंब पर रघुकुल राज है तेज तम अंश पर कान्हा जिमी कंस पर त्यो मलेच वंश पर शेर शिवराज है दैट्स छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज एंड दीज आर लाइन्स ऑफ महाकवि भूषण देव इंस्पायर्ड अ जेनरेशन देव इंस्पायर्ड जेनरेशन ऑफ वॉरियर्स देव इंस्पायर्ड जेनरेशन ऑफ इंडियंस छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज वॉट डज छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज मीन फॉर इन मीन मीन फॉर पीपल लाइक यू एंड आई फॉर इंडिया द फाउंडर ऑफ द हिंदवी स्वराज द फाउंडर ऑफ अ मॉडर्न इंडियन स्टेट लेट मी ब्रिंग सम ऑफ द फाइनेस्ट वॉइसेज ऑन छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज ऑन स्टेज टू टॉक अबाउट वॉट छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज मीन्स फॉर अस लेट मी इन्वाइट ऑन स्टेज वैभव पुरंदरे ओथर ऑफ शिवाजी India's great warrior king. Let me also take this opportunity to invite Manu Pillai, author and historian. Manu, welcome on stage. And Dr. Amol Kole, member of Parliament, Lok Sabha, actor and doctor. Gentlemen, welcome. When we talk about Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj and Vaibhav, let me begin by asking you. Chhatrapati Shivaji the first image that comes to your mind the founder of a modern indian state the founder of a modern indian navy Chhatrapati Shivaji is a singular figure in the history of india gaurav and especially in the early modern history of india imagine an individual taking on an empire it's hardly a contest imagine that the empire that is taking on is one of the world's biggest and covers one fifth of the world's land surface and it's a completely hopeless situation yet this man from one corner of the western deccan takes on the mughal empire when it's at the height of its glory under emperor aurangzeb and not only establishes his own independent sovereign state but sows the seeds of the destruction of the mughal empire he fashions a template of governance which is his own he frames policies for responsible and responsive governance rejects completely the civilian political and revenue administration and he gives robust expression above all to values of religious plurality values which aurangzeb is actively and aggressively working against so he's a pivotal figure and he's certainly the progenitor of the indian navy gaurav the insignia of the indian navy has been taken from chhatrapati shivaji maharaj navy and how many people at that time knew yes we've had a chola navy manu uh, but why is it that the credit now is given to chhatrapati shivaji maharaj is this politics or is there more to it well there's a can you hear me yeah there's always politics because you know he's such a fascinating figure and each political ideology can find something in him that they can appropriate and this isn't a, a contemporary thing necessarily if you look at the 19th century uh, take somebody like jyotiba phule he sees shivaji as a leader of peasants somebody who's fighting for the people and he actively plays down the brahmin influence uh, take somebody like uh, eknath tanaji um, and he you know he does the opposite he says that it was actually shivaji's brahmin mentor dadoji uh, kondev who was the one energizing shivaji's activities when when tilak comes into the picture he's not interested necessarily in social reform in the same way as phule is he says let's look at him as somebody fighting imperialism because we need to find fight colonialism so different groups at different times end up appropriating different sides of shivaji ultimately it's all one chatrapati but because he's a king he's done so many things 
that you know everybody picks and chooses what they want, which continues even now. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of debates as a result of that. But yes, I think the, the, on, on the naval principle, Weber has covered that in his book as well. It's, let's say, a more recent example than the Cholas. There's greater evidence. The colonial period had already started. The Portuguese were already in the picture. Therefore, what he achieved attains a certain salience that perhaps we don't associate with the Cholas that easily. Dr. Kuala, you are an actor, you're a political leader, you're a doctor. For you, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, uh, is it is it about politics? Because as an actor, you've played the Chhatrapati. What does he mean to you? See, there is one fact about Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. When you consider the great 17s of the world, if you consider the great 17s, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj stands out to be the only king who was not born as a king, who never betrayed anyone to become a king. He sworn himself as a king, and when he passed away till that time, he was a king. If you apply this criteria, this four criteria, none of the great 17 stand on this criteria in front of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. And as Vaibhavji said, ki it's not only a kingdom. And as Manuji rightfully pointed out, ki the navy, this is not only building a navy, this is not only protecting a nation, this is a religious revolution. Because in that era, Samudra Paryatan, ye nishid mana gaya tha Hindu dharm mein. That's why in 7th century, Cholas had their navy, and then for thousand uh, years, for 10 centuries, none of the Hindu king could build a strong navy, and that was the reason why Portuguese, Dutch, British, Arabs, everybody was conquering our country. And Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was the king who realized this fact, and he built his own navy after 1,000 years. So he becomes a visionary, he was a revolutionary, or a bohat badi baat hai mere liye, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, ki dharm satta or raj satta. There is always a clash between religious authority and political authority. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj set up an example in this land that religious authority should not overpower political authority. Instead, both should work hand in hand for the well-being of people. And most importantly, from political point of view, he was the first person who apne kingdom ko apna naam nahi diya. It was Rayetetsa Raja. It was not Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's empire. It was not Bhosla empire. It was not Maratha empire. It was Swaraj. It was Rayetetsa Raj. So I feel the uh, foundation of democracy can be seen in Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Swaraj. You know, when you talk about Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, was he way ahead of his times? Uh, of course, the founder of a Hindvi Swaraj, uh, a Hindu uh, kingdom at a time when Aurangzeb or his part, the Mughal Empire, was at its peak. But at the same time, when we talk about Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj setting up a navy from scratch, 50 warships, but hundreds of trade ships apparently, am I right? Yeah, close to 700 trading vessels that he had. Now, it's astonishing, there's been a lot of comparison between the Chola Navy and Shivaji's Navy. Now, there's a difference here, there's a significant di difference, and there's a reason that Chhatrapati Shivaji stands out in this respect. Now, the Cholas were undoubtedly great, they were warriors, they were conquerors, they were kings, they went all the way to Southeast Asia. but. After the Chola Empire disintegrates in the 1250s, for 500 years, like Dr. Kolhe pointed out, neither the Mughal Empire, nor the Bahamani Kingdoms, nor the Nizam Shahi, nor the Adil Shahi, nor the Qutub Shahi, nobody in this land recognizes the significance of the coastline in terms of both defense and trade. Chhatrapati Shivaji is alone among his contemporaries to recognize that significance. And astonishingly, when he starts his political career, India's vast coastline is dominated by four foreign powers. The British, the Portuguese who've come and started ruling Goa from 1510 onwards, the French and the Dutch, and there are the African Siddhis as well. 
and not a single Indian ruler has thought of building a navy. And at the age of 28 and 29, he starts building his navy from scratch. He's got absolutely no technology to build a navy. So he borrows technology from the British and from the Portuguese. And there are letters from the Mughal emperor to the British officials in Western India saying, your people are building Shivaji's navy. Are you cooperating or collaborating with Shivaji? And they are saying, no, no, and it's all there in the records that, no, but he's paying up engineers, he's taking away our engineers and taking the help of the technology they have to build his own navy. This activity of his begins in 1659, 58, 59, in Kalyan, Bhivan, Thane district, along the western coastal belt. And by the year 1674, by the, year, by the time he's 44 years old and he's crowned as an independent king, as a Chhatrapati, as the bearer of the royal umbrella, he has 50 vessels which are into combat. They are of different quality, they are varying quality rather. Some are swift, swift moving vessels in the sea, some are really heavy vessels which can carry cannon and other stuff like that. And there are close to 700 trading vessels that he is, uh, you know, he, that he sends out to countries even in Western Asia to carry out trade. So he is singular again in this respect. And that is the difference between him and the Cholas. Also about the Cholas, one thing we need to keep in mind is the Cholas has an, have had an intrinsic awareness about the importance of the waters because their, wa their kingdom was born in a river valley. So they had that inner awareness. Chhatrapati Shivaji starts out in the mountains, in the Deccan. And he slowly, systematically starts moving towards the sea because he sees the importance of the sea when nobody else has recognized it. And eventually he builds his kingdom, Raigad, along the Konkan coastline. And something that then Kanhoji... His father's fighting in the south, so he's raised by a woman who sort of... And all this is the popular history, right? It's his mother who energizes some, something in him to go out and do something special. He starts working from within the frame and within the debris of the old system, but then creates something new. He also faces a lot of personal challenges. There's illness towards the end. There seems to be domestic discord toward the, towards the end. His son defects briefly. So every aspect of his life has drama, it has valor, it has vision, it has a whole series, series of things happening. So it's not surprising that Indians from the colonial period especially, of course his story was well known before that, decided to appropriate him as an icon. First as a regional icon, and then quickly he became a national icon because the ingredients were all there. Now the result is that in post-independence India, again political parties end up choosing different sides of it. Some people say he was a secular figure, except that secularism wasn't a feature or a, a characteristic or a value as such in his time. Pluralism might be the correct word, but not necessarily modern secularism as we know it. Others say that he was a protector of the Hindus, which is true if you look at his kingly narrative. Once he's crowned uh, Chhatrapati, and in the Shiva Bharata, for example, he does talk about wiping out nature dharma. He does talking about Hindavi Swaraj and, 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 and themes like that. But all the same, if you look at his own father's name, his uncle's name, they were named after a Muslim Sufi saint called Shah Sharif. So the pluralism is there, but his kingly narrative also gives some wind in the sails of political Hinduism. So different parties using him in different ways or using... That you wouldn't want to delve into even if you wanted to? It's uh, actually individual choice. Uh, talking about or your voters' choice. Talking about myself, uh, I try to put Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj more in analytical way. I always try to see which is the need of the R. That Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj sirf sar par lekar naachne ki baat nahi hai, wo unki values samajne ki baat hai. For political things, yeah, when you held Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, jab aap Jai Shivrai bolte ho, jab aap Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj ki Jai bolte ho, to along with that Jai Jai car, some responsibility also comes to you. There are, there are many kingdoms which might be bigger than Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, which might be wealthier than Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, but if we try to understand why still Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj is national icon or is dear to us is our pride, I find ki the moral values, the moral, strong moral ground Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Swaraj had, that is the reason and yes, for any political party, before hailing Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, they have to introspect 
about that moral ground for personally as you say chhatrapati shivaji maharaj is an ideal example of jise hum asakti aur virakti kehte hain so itna bada empire khada karne ke baad bhi he could say idam na mam he maza nahi it's up to everyone how he practices chhatrapati shivaji maharaj in his own life like i am an mp i am member of parliament we are entitled to get 36 business class travels during parliament i practice chhatrapati shivaji maharaj in a manner that i haven't traveled by business class i don't travel by business class i don't avail that facility because this is a practice of asakti and virakti i don't take police guard i don't take security kyunki agar rehte cha rajya rehte cha swarajya ye agar aap mante ho to why should be afraid of your own people so this is i feel any political party or any political person can practice the values taught or led down in this land by chhatrapati shivaji maharaj as per his own vision and there's so much that he did that uh, that is not very well known because some may want to see him as a yes he is the founder of the hindvi swaraj he is a hindu king uh, but um, how many people know that two of his admirals were actually uh, muslims ibrahim khan gardi or uh, there were others who were very close to him and he always ensured uh, if i remember cor reading correctly that the quran must be respected women must be respected he made that very clear followed it yeah kora uh, i believe that chhatrapati shivaji was out to create essentially a hindu polity so i agree with manu that uh, the word secularism does not really apply it's a hindu polity which is broadly inclusive in nature and does not discriminate between people of different faiths and it's a deeply humanistic philosophy you know based on the teachings of the bhakti saint poets of maharashtra and of the deccan you look at his sense of pluralism and kafi khan one of his worst critics who at one point in time calls him a hell dog says in writing that shivaji had given express instructions to his soldiers that if they found a copy of the quran anyway during their campaigns or when they were conquering a fort or any place they had to treat it with the highest respect and return it to its rightful owner similarly if women were captured or children were captured they had to be returned home with the respect they deserved one of the earliest decisions he takes in his life when he is looking after his father's jagir in pune at the age of 16 is against the entrenched vested interests there is a police patil a guy who's head of the administrative and revenue jurisdiction of the village and he carries out a sexual assault against a, an ordinary woman villager and one of shivaji's earliest letters and orders is about that woman saying that first he verifies whether the complaint is correct or not once he is convinced that it's correct he gives him capital punishment now we are not in the era of capital punishment but this is what he does at the age of 16 and that sends out a message right across the region that this man is actually taking on the entrenched interests he is taking on vested interests he is taking on people who have hereditary grants of rights the vatandars the zamindars and all these people and that is how ordinary faceless people come to demonstrate so much loyalty for him that they are willing to lay down their lives for him at the time of his age at in today's day and age manu uh, some aspects about the chhatrapati uh, because of politics uh, does it become a landmine to write or not to write about it uh, you know whether he is seen as a as a gau brahman pratipalak or he is he is seen as someone whose coronation led to uh, an issue being raised at that point of time when it was written about in books it had to be removed from those books you know this is there's the famous james lane episode for example which i think boils down to one sentence in his book uh, which was controversial now you take that sentence i'm not talking, going to talk about it but it was a, a, a lewd remark about his parents and the thing is you zoom out and you see that lots of historical figures in india there are similar stories that people have concocted about them and you realize that hold on this is just a way to in a sense dilute the value of the person 
And some groups within Indian society have also tried this, from Adi Shankaracharya onwards to Mahatma Ayankali in Kerala, you have similar stories. So but then, you know, even talking about that upsets people and that the archives in, in Pune, the Bandarka Institute was attacked and so on, which was unfortunate because, you know, they didn't, they had nothing to do with it. Uh, then there's the fact that sometimes we are not comfortable talking about the historical evolution of the icon. The icon did not come fully ready-made to us in the 20th century. Some people looked at it, picked out certain things and then celebrated that. You know, for example, in the, in the 1880s, it was found that Chhatrapati's uh, Samadhi in Raigad was in a state of complete disrepair. And I think it was Ranade who first made the effort to try and get something done. And the Bombay government allotted four rupees. Ten years later, Tilak takes it over and he has this huge newspaper campaign and people donate 15,000 rupees altogether, ordinary people. But the Maratha princes of the time actually don't donate large sums of money, including the Chhatrapati's own descendant. Because they're actually donating to education, they're donating to these other sansthas that are there, and they don't really see this necessarily as a very important thing. There's, of course, again, that Brahmin Maratha politics to it, because Tilak and the Congress is dominated by Brahmins. So that comes into the picture. Sometimes when people talk about these processes in that colonial period, it can become a bit sensitive. But I think with a bit of maturity, we can talk about it. It's not such but, a big deal. you know, considering... When, when people talk about Napoleon or when they talk about others, Chhatrapati Shivaji, Dr. Kohli was, was huge. But is he at times politically reduced to just being, you know, a caste figure or a regional figure for regional politics? And that needs to be avoided, isn't it, sir? Yes, I totally agree with that. Ki he should not be restricted or he should not be reduced to only uh, caste or only region. It's Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj is much beyond that, but it lies right from the educational point of view. We are not ready to go analytically towards our, any of our great figures of the nation. So similarly, if you apply like management principles to Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj stands out very tall with SWOT analysis, with leadership skills, everything. If you apply social engineering principles to Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Ashtapradhan Mandal, the ministry, is an ideal example of social engineering in that era. The people from different castes, according to their gene pool specialities, were collected together and they were motivated towards a very larger goal. So these things are defi uh, deficient in REA, but we look at history as only pride. We don't look at history as an analytical view. So, a very simple thing is that Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, when Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was born, is our first question to answer in our schools. Our schools don't teach ki what values of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj you should inculcate in your life. Our value, our value, our value, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj ke guru kaun the? And we start to fight on this, but we don't want to tell this value that Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj is an ideal example of adaptation. Adaptation to nature, adaptation to society, adaptation to the social needs. And if these values come in front of us, definitely it's not only a political thing, it's our mindset. The mindset of every Indian, not just to adore, but to analyze and inculcate. Absolutely, and you have Ashth Pradhan Mandali ka zikr kiya. That was an era, Vaibhav, when everyone was talking about Persian names and Persian seals uh, to, to sound really big. Didn't Chhatrapati make that big switch? We are talking about decolonization in 2022. Chhatrapati Shivaji did it in his times with a Sanskrit seal and a Sanskrit name. That's remarkable because the royal insignia of Chhatrapati Shivaji's father he and his mother was in Persian. The insignias of all the Hindu Rajas of the South at the time, those who still existed in the Persianate age, we can correctly call it the Persianate age, were in Persian. And those Rajas also used to call themselves the Sultans after the Sultanates. But Chhatrapati Shivaji, again at the age of 16, brings out his own insignia which is not in Persian, unlike his parents' insignia. It's in Sanskrit. Then, at the time of his coronation in 1674, when he forms his Ashtapradhan, or Council of Ministers, 
he tells his officials to create an altogether new dictionary which will replace the Persian terms with Sanskrit words for names of ministers, for titles and designations given to officials and all of that. Remarkably, one of his big lieutenants, Netaji Palkar, defects and goes to Aurangzeb. He spends 10 years in the Northwest as Mohammad Kuli Khan. And he comes back to Shivaji, disappointed with Aurangzeb's reign, his repression of Hindus and all of that. And Shivaji reconverts him to the Hindu faith. He also rebuilds the Saptakoteshwar temple which the Portuguese have destroyed in Goa. So he will not allow his own cultural, social and civilizational identity to be obliterated. And at the same time, he will be inclusive and highly tolerant of other communities and respect other faiths and their holy books as well. During his raid of Surat, his first raid of Surat, he actually gives instructions to his soldiers not to touch the church of the French missionaries there. Yeah, and, he, and he asks his soldiers to protect that church because he believes those people are doing good work there. So much to learn, so much to learn, so much to imbibe and emulate. Uh, I've run out of time on this part uh, of the discussion, but for joining me here um, on this India Today Conclave special, gentlemen, many thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And if I could just request uh, Dinesh Bhatia to join us uh, on stage, the group CEO of India Today group, to thank our panelists. Also a reminder that you can buy Vaibhav Purandare and Manupile's books and get them signed at the Author's Corner that's just opposite the All Day Conclave Cafe.